recorded in the book of Exodus, the Old Testament shares with us how God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. The first four addressing our relationship with God, the following six, our relationship with others. So here's laid down the two basic responsibilities for us as creatures created by God for relationship with himself and with each other. The vertical relationship with God, the horizontal relationship with each other. Relationship is really a part of what we possess and hold as image bearers. The image of God in us is reflected in relationship. He is in relationship with himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he calls us into relationship with him and with each other. When Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law, he responded by summarizing the Ten Commandments in these two categories. And let me read for that for you that for you from Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So it should come as no surprise to us that when Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give you, that it was the commandment to love. So what was new about it? He said, a new commandment I give you. I'll read it again, John 13, 33, and 34, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The new in this New commandment appears to be clarity. Clarity about the motivation of Jesus' example and the testimony that love bears, the evidence of love, the effect of love to all men that they might see and understand that these disciples and we as well are his. So first let's look at the reality that this is a command. He said, a new commandment I give you. What exactly is a command? Well, it's something that's required, right? It is obligatory. It's not a suggestion. It's not up for debate or discussion. There will be no democratic vote about a command, will there? The only vote is by an act of obedience or an act of disobedience. We each have the choice. And a command is an opportunity for obedience. John began this chapter that these verses are in, chapter 13, with the words, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. For Jesus, love was a chosen act of obedience. And his obedience led him to the ultimate expression of love. Paul recorded it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Jesus was obedient to his Father's command, and we are called to be obedient as well. Obedience to the command to love. As with Jesus, so for us. It's a choice, a choice involving action. 
action that expresses obedience. So I came to this point in my preparation and I thought there's a question in order. So why this message now? Well, my time with you is almost up. And number one, I want to affirm you for being the loving, supportive, affirming church that you are. I'm not sure I've ever been in a healthier church anywhere. The relationships, the strength of ministries, everything about this church. Lil and I first joined this church in 1986. There are only a few folks here today who were here back then, but it was just like it is now, loving and affirming and supportive. So I want to affirm you in that, and that's a good way to think about ourselves in anticipation of a new pastor coming. We are a loving church. We'll be called to love him and his wife. And the second thought along that line is I want to challenge you because we can always do better. And I say we because I'm, I'm one of you. I'm part of this fellowship. Paul wrote in Galatians 6, verse 2, Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. What exactly is the law of Christ? To love. That's the law of Christ. And later, John wrote in 1 John 3, 18, Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and truth. Not enough to just say it. You've got to show it. It's got to be evident in our choices and our actions. So the question always comes, how well are we loving? Self-evaluation is a good thing. The Apostle Paul included in his Galatian letter, these words found in chapter 5, verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there it is. Love God and love others. This command that we just read, John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus restated just a couple of chapters later, in chapter 15, verses 12 through 14, he said, This is my commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. And what does he command us? A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. So Jesus' commandment is clear to love one another. Any questions? It's just that simple. Now what about our motivation? What about our motivation? Well, think with me about those words that we just read from John 15. As I have loved you. His example we're motivated to love by Jesus' example. Verse 34b says, Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We love because he loved. We learn that from him. John said it best in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. There it is in just plain, simple language. To love him leads us to love all others that he also loves. He loves through us. The Apostle Paul clarified the power of this motivating force in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So here we are. And here we go. We're not commanded and then abandoned. The power of the Holy Spirit is at work in us, transforming us and empowering us to walk in obedience. He doesn't require something, but he doesn't provide us with the strength and the power and the ability to do. And obeying comes easily for a heart that is submitted 
to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit working his work of transformation and leading us. I'm particularly in love with two verses, two statements that Paul made in his letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians 2.13, he said, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Aren't you glad? Not left to our own devices, his power is at work in us. And in the first chapter, verse 6, he said, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. We're not abandoned. We're not on our own. His power is at work in us, and he will complete what he started. He will mold and shape us in love. He will mold and shape us into the likeness of Jesus. So motivated by Jesus' example and empowered by his presence, we should be primed, and ready to go out and love everybody, right? But that's real general, isn't it? Not just everybody, but somebody. We need to sometimes be specific. So the question comes, how do I need to cooperate more fully with the Holy Spirit's transforming power to make me love more like Jesus? I didn't want to wag my finger at you. I asked the question in the first person. How do I? But the question models it for you. You ask for yourself, how do I? How do I cooperate more fully with the Holy Spirit's transforming power in me? How do I demonstrate greater deeds of kindness? How do I act more compassionately? How do I practice greater patience? How am I to be more attentive, more available? All of those are practical things that express love in action. Motivated by Jesus' example, we are commanded to love. And finally, the testimony of love. Verse 35, and by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Here's the greatest testimony to all the world, how we love each other. Both the evidence of our love and his love in us and the effect of our love touching other people. We preach the gospel first by the way we live. Our words then make sense because they are consistent with what we've done, how we've acted, how we've lived. In my years of pastoral ministry, I only served two churches. One of them I went to following a split, or maybe it would be called a departure. There was a group in that church that was at odds with the pastor over some issue, immaterial at this point years and years later. But they couldn't get their way, and so in mass they left about 14 or 15 families, over 100 members of the church. They're one day gone the next. And the church was grieving. But those that were left were the cream of the crop. And they kept on loving their pastor. And over the years that followed made a difference because they just kept on loving. It's really interesting how when something like that happens in a small town, you can't get away from it. Those who left ran into those who stayed at 4-H meetings and school gatherings. And it wasn't always pretty. But the ones I was privileged to pastor just kept on loving. And it was a testimony to God's presence in their lives and the power of his spirit working in that church. They stuck it out. Faithfulness to the love commandment. So I was thinking about this and going through these verses and preparing for this morning, I was reminded of that song that I'm not sure exactly when it originated. I think Jars of Clay made it popular 25 years or so ago. 
They will know that we are Christians by our love. You familiar with that chorus? We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored. And they will know that we are Christians by our love. That reminds me of another old hymn. I don't think we've sung it in a long, long time. Love is the theme. You remember that one? You hymn lovers? Of the themes that men have known, one supremely stands alone. Through the ages it has shown, tis his wonderful, wonderful love. Love is the theme. Love is supreme. Sweeter it grows, glory bestows. Bright as the sun, ever it glows. Love is the theme, eternal theme. That should be our theme song. Love is the theme. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. I was trying to remember the author's name this morning as I was thinking about this quote. Oh my goodness, then I thought longer and it must have been 50 years ago, maybe longer probably not more than 50, that Josh McDowell wrote some book and in it he had the image of someone on trial for their faith and he raised the question and here it is for us today. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? What is the evidence? How we love. How we love, that's the evidence that proves we're his. So this morning, as we sing our invitation hymn, because he lives, because he lives, because he loves, that's all we've got, Jesus and his presence and his power at work in us. How does he want us to live this week? More like him, more loving, more kind, more considerate, more powerful by the moving of his spirit in our lives. How many of us are here? There could be that many individual unique applications. How does his spirit speak to you this morning about the way you live and the way you love? Let's pray and then sing and you come as his spirit leads you to respond to his grace, mercy, and love. Father, we love you because you first loved us. We praise and worship you. We bow before you. Thank you for Jesus, for your love revealed in him. Thank you for his obedience to the cross. Thank you for your power that raised him from the dead, victorious over sin and death. And thank you, Father, for your love revealed by your Holy Spirit in our hearts, calling us to repentance and faith and growing us in your grace. We praise and worship you. And I pray, Father, for each one of us here that we would go through moments regularly of self-evaluation and allow your spirit to convict us and reveal to us those ways in which we need to love more, love better, be more like Jesus. Grow us in that way by your presence and your power because we cannot do it on our own. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.